Hey there, friends. Villagers, trolls, <laughs> Dave Politis, can Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. Thanks for being here. And uh, we're going to cover a lot of things today. And I have three really, really unusual cases for you. They're mind benders. And some of the letters I have today are mind benders. And I'm going to start right off uh, talking about Alaska and something that was chilling uh, that came out in the news this week. Here's the title of the article. Amid spike in suicides in Alaska, the Army invested in mental health, but the problem is getting worse. As many as 15 soldiers stationed in Alaska have died by suicide this year. This is 2021. More than double the number of such deaths in all of 2020 in a crisis that has defied a solution. I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but it says uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin came to visit after USA Today reported that at least six soldiers in Alaska have died by suicide in the first five months of 2021. That's more than one a month. Despite the attention, despite the attention, suicides among the 11,500 soldiers in Alaska have continued. The Army has confirmed 10 suicide deaths among soldiers in 2021, with another five deaths under investigation for suicide or accident. They're not admitting to it all. Despite spending $214 million in fiscal year 2020, in a quality of life campaign at Fort Wainwright in Fairbanks, suicides have continued. From, July 14, from January 2014 to March 2019, there were 11 suicides among soldiers in Fort Wainwright. So in five years, 11 soldiers from 14 to 19. And they've already had a thousand percent more. This is unbelievable. This is funny. This isn't funny, but this part is. Bitter cold, frequent training and deployment in geographic and social isolation have been cited as stresses in the lives of the soldiers stationed in Alaska. The relatively high cost of living, alcohol abuse, sleep disorders, and during the long dark winter can contribute to mental health issues. Alaska senior leaders conduct monthly counseling sessions based on the Army program to talk with soldiers about mental health. There's also a version of the program specific to Alaska that emphasizes resilience in the Arctic environment. The rate of suicide increased in, from 20.3 in 2015 to 28.7 per 100,000 in 2020. Young enlisted men are the highest risk for suicide, according to the report. This is what the Army said in response. This is no easy fix. If there was, we would have solved this problem long ago, not just in the military. So they're blaming the issue on society. But the problem at Fort in Alaska is horrific. Clear, here's a quote. Clearly, military leadership has taken steps to try to address this crisis, but nothing has changed, Spire said. It's time to create an independent review of the military's suicide prevention and response efforts. Uh, yeah, a thousand percent agree. So the members of Congress who oversee the Armed Services Committee personnel panels blasted the Pentagon for not doing more. Representative Jackie Spear from California pressed Pentagon officials in June to stand up an independent commission to study the military suicide programs. Oh, yeah. So, friends, I've never understood this, ever. So we have young men from our families that are going into the service. And if we don't treat them like important, qualified, people that we care about. If we don't let them know that they're valued, if we aren't keeping a pulse on their mental and physical condition, we're doing them wrong. 
Yeah, okay, somebody breaks an ankle, the army's going to take care of it. Uh, somebody has a fever, the army's going to take care of it. But more importantly than all that, isn't mental health at the top of that scale as well? I am flustered because I've known about this rate of suicide amongst armed forces soldiers for many years. And that means that Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard also know about these problems. And it's almost like they don't want to even acknowledge it exists. It's a disgusting side note, super disgusting side note to the to joining the military. Do I think they're doing enough? Heck no. Do I think that they're even trying very hard? Probably not. And that's, obviously if you have a problem this big, you need a team to come in brainstorming. You ask the people involved. You ask what their possible solutions are. Etc. 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 If the location is a problem, maybe we ought to close the fort. Gee, that's a huge sign of intellect. Or maybe we ought to rotate the soldiers in and out of there more frequently. Each one of those men or women that committed suicide at the fort, they had families that cared about them immensely. And for the military not show as much concern for the quality people we give them is disturbing. A lot of people don't know this. <laughs> I was made aware of it a few months ago. Do you know that there's a list of countries that the United States won't send postage to? Did you know two of those countries are Australia and New Zealand? Yeah. So my question, is this part of an isolation attempt? Let me tell you the countries. The US Postal Service will not deliver to Australia, Afghanistan, Bhutan, Brunei, Central African Republic, Chad, Cuba, French Guiana, Guadeloupe, the Lao People's Democratic Republic, Liberia, Libya, Martinique, Mongolia, New Zealand, Papua, Papua New Guinea, Reunion, St. Pierre and Macallan, Samoa, Sierra Leone, Solomon Islands, South Sudan, Syria, Tajikistan, Timor, Turkmenistan, and Yemen. A couple of those places, I, I, I really don't get it. Martinique, that's in the Bahamas area the Caribbean, that's not very far away. Guadeloupe, that's not very far away. But Australia and New Zealand, those are huge countries. Why are we delivering there? I don't understand our government, I'm sorry. So the uh, title of the story is Hunter in a Swamp. David, don't know if you're getting this email, but if you do, you were asking for some unusual events, and this is one. This happened to me back in 73. I've been hunting and fishing my whole life and still do it on a regular basis. Back then, three older guys from work heard that I went deer hunting every year and hunted alone most of the time. They were also impressed that I also started bow hunting back in 66 when I was in high school. These guys were all in their 60s, and I was in my 20s. They invited me to go deer hunting with them to... Thief River Falls, Minnesota. Absolutely, I said. So the first week of November 73, we headed out to northern Minnesota for the rifle deer opener. Saturday morning, we all went out of town on our, went out of our, we all went out our own way to hunt. I walked out about a half mile and found a great spot where the woods ended and there's a big swamp. We all agreed to meet back on the dirt road at 9.30 a.m., go to the camper and eat breakfast and make some drives, and then go back out for the evening hunt. It was a cloudy morning. Clouds were hanging out real low in the sky. 
had a moose walk within 10 yards and hid behind a big tree as he passed by. I looked at my watch and saw it was 9 a.m., so I should be heading back. As I started out, I was skirting the swamp and started feeling something weird. I kept hearing a humming sound and trying to figure out where it was coming from. The sound reminded me of the way we would hear big power lines hum when we were young. But we were out in the boonies and nothing around for miles. I started walking into the swamp in the direction of the sound. It was coming from the clouds. My face started getting numb and I knew something wasn't right. I pointed my rifle up in the direction of the sound and all I remember is taking the safety off and the next thing I was walking along the edge of the woods towards the road. I could see the guys on the road and all, all were yelling at me. Where have you been? They yelled. We've been looking for you all day. Are you on drugs or what? I told them that I've never done drugs in my life. I told them my watch says it's 9.30. They said it's almost 5 p.m. and I screwed up their hunt for the day. Here's where it gets weird. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that wasn't weird? <laughs> While I was sleeping that night in the camper, I had a dream of a fox coming towards me in the woods. I looked at the fox and noticed it had real big eyes. I yelled out that you're not a fox, raised my rifle, aimed, and woke up. I was soaking wet with sweat, so much that my long johns and sleeping bag were so wet you could wring them out. One of the guys woke up and asked if I was okay. I changed into a different set of long johns, and the guys had a bunch of old army blankets and I was, that I was given to sleep in. Before I went back to sleep, I looked outside and noticed we were having a blizzard. Eight inches of snow that night. The next morning, I decided to go back where I was hunting the morning before to see if I could find out what happened. Didn't find anything. My watch never worked again. My wife bought, my, bought me the watch for my birthday. It was a Pulsar digital watch. The first of its kind in 73. She paid a lot of money for it. I took it back where she bought it and they told me they couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. They said they were sending it back and the company to get it fixed. They called me a week later and said that the company couldn't figure out why they couldn't get it to work, so they gave me a new one. I've only told four people in my life this, and everyone, including my wife, started laughing. One started making the sound of the theme of the Twilight Zone. Pretty much keep it to myself after that. I've watched almost every video you have put out and enjoy every one and always waiting for the next one each week. Thinking about it, I could have been one of those missing. Thanks for everything you do. Keep it up. I've heard very similar stories, which is why I read this. Very similar. The humming sound is pretty common. I mean, kind of common. I've probably read about it five to eight times in my life. And it's coming from the air. I've also heard a, a humming sound coming from Earth. So, guy's lucky he's okay. Dave, thank you for your stalwart dedication to investigating and presenting the 411 mystery and for your care of the village, which has grown. Hey, it's the only reason I'm here is for you guys. So I'm very grateful that anyone wants to listen to me. I've been pondering on a few things through a Catholic lens and wanted to send them your way. My thinking here revolves around this question. What happens to the souls of those who have gone missing and have died? I am not trained as a theo theologian, <coughs> so I'd like to qualify that these are just musings. <coughs> a couple of things about that before you skip over and don't stop. Several months ago, I met a really great writer named Leslie Keen, K-E-A-N. Leslie's written some fantastic books. And one of them about reincarnation. And one of the stories goes, she interviewed a series of people who thought that they had dealt with someone who was reincarnated. One of the stories dealt with a very young boy, very young, that started to show traits of being an experienced pilot and had talked about certain engagements, flying a plane. This is like a young boy, two years old, barely able to talk. 
And he talked about dying and the location. And this is after the parents had never even talked to the boy about anything like this. Make a very long story short, after years of talking to the boy, they figured out who he was in another life and where he died, the circumstances of his death, and then they confirmed this with other people that were in his fighter squadron. It was an amazing story. And uh, Leslie did a great job putting it together. And the reason I got onto that was when Ben was in the Krishna world, he talked to me a lot about reincarnation and how there's various levels of life form. And you say, well, Dad, think about, you know, you have a mosquito and you have maybe an ant. And then as you step up the line, you have grasshoppers and then you have bugs that can fly and then you have birds. And these different life forms represent a different progression up the line of intellect and smart. And you go from birds to maybe fish and then mammals. And he, we talked about this a lot and how there were high intellect mammals and there were some mammals that obviously had very low intellect. And, and that somehow or another, when you come back reincarnated, there's some belief systems that the more good you do on earth, the better the chance you have coming back at that same level that you were at, or even progressing up. There's other people who believe that, and this is after doing a lot of research, that when you are in that spiritual realm, you're giving an overview of a possible life and you make the choice of whether you want to go. So you're, let's just say, uh, you're going to go back on earth and you're going to be a male and you're going to live in a paltry existence and you're going to have to fight for your life many times and you're going to be very poor, but you're going to live a long life. Some, some religious sects believe that these are the options you're given. But they wholly agree that you are going to be reincarnated. And since I had those intellectual talks with Ben, it got my mind going in a great, in a great way. Because you start to look at wildlife differently. And you start to look at our life here differently. So I've always asked myself, well, what's, what's our role here on earth? Were we just, is it nothing more than we're stuck here, placed here, and they're watching to see how we exist? Or is there some type of level that we're to perform to? and to see if we can surpass what we first thought we could do when we were young. Or we to grow as people. At retirement, are we supposed to just go into a cocoon and live the rest of the li our lives watching TV and, and eating TV dinners? Or at retirement, are we supposed to press ourselves and go further? And what I think what I've always thought about this, when I first became a policeman, there were a couple of detectives that were, that were so far and above, be, beyond anything I had experienced as a detective, it was ridiculous. These guys had skills, insight, that I probably never had. And their ability to look at a crime scene and understand what happened and the mindset of the person who did it was phenomenal. And some of the times I've sat with them on interviewing people, it was just, it was eye-opening. So these people had super skills. So when they retired, 
Did they just put those skills in a box, buried them, and lost forever? I've thought about this for all types of professions. Think, let's think about a truck driver, for instance, that's driven a truck for 30 years. He knows certain things about driving the roadway, about driving a truck, about dealing with business people, about movement of loads that someone who first comes isn't, isn't aware of. It takes years to get some of that information. So I've always thought that it would be pretty cool to have a massive retirement network of people that had perfected their life skills in whatever. And that you as the newcomer could come on board and contact those people and ask them what they learned in 30 years that maybe you could teach me in 15. What were the big things in life that you learned? So I don't step on those grenades in life. Could you help me? I always thought about that. But anyhow, it's a kind of a side issue. Reincarnation. So this person goes on and says, uh, the communion of saints is a fundamental and immemorial teaching of the church, namely that those who enter the great company of heaven can intercede for those on earth, and we can likewise venerate them and invoke their prayers to God Almighty. According to doctrine, one must die in a state of grace to join the communion of saints, and most would also have to pass through purgatory to make amends for any negative impact on our earthly decisions. Now, I suppose it would be impossible to investigate the condition of the souls, those who have gone missing, but I am often struck by, A, how genuine, genuinely good these people are. This might be gleaned by their excellence in sports, fitness, and academia, and by well-loved by their friends and family who could reflect a good interior life. And of course, you have found that many are hardly religious. B. The practically never, correct me if I'm wrong here, seems to be obviously bad people who go missing in these cases. No people with criminal records or notoriety. I imagine, however, that this bad characteristic would be very difficult to ascertain as one's life or one's own affair. There might be some bad people who have disappeared, but from what I have researched, over 99%, crystal clean and are trying to do something good with their life. Onward. If Catholic teaching is true, many of these people are likely in union with God in heaven, so they would be able to intercede for their separated family members, friends, and communities. It would be interesting to know what happens to their families after their loved one goes missing. Do they experience any blessings in spite of their loss? How long does it take them to heal? Do they ever get a sense of peace? Again, I imagine this would be very hard to ascertain for the same reason. On another note, I find it interesting that the timing of a disappearance can seem to coincide with a particular event at the point in the person's life. At least I just remember this one case, but perhaps not. I wouldn't be surprised, there are others. The ballet dancer, Raffaella Stroik, who went missing in 2018 just after she had consulted with her priest to contemplate being a nun. Her life was snuffed out just as she was making a pivotal decision to make a sacrifice of her own life to God. This is true, I talked about this in a video. And her life was sacrificed, just not in the way she had expected. I was very shaken when you reported on this. Was this the devil intentionally hunting her down after she had made a good resolution? This made me very paranoid after I started to think this. It is a dangerous thought, though figures such as St. Philippe Neri say that you can expect tribulations to come after experiencing great sweetness in your spiritual life. The communion of saints may be of some comfort to families of missing 411 as it is us to us all. We should rest and hope that our loved ones are still connected with us in the mystical body of Christ and that they pray and look after us like the angels. As an aside for you, David, I know you, have, you may hope that's the same for your Ben. I believe that his heavy bipolar illness, which you described, would almost certainly reduce the culpability of the sin of taking one's life. Okay, let me stop there for a second. After Ben took his life, 
I was very worried about the classification of him committing a sin by taking his life. And I had several people very high in religion from throughout North America come to me and say, David, no, it's not a sin to take your life. And anyone who says that to you, do not believe them. I had this probably 10 times. So I, I tend not to believe this. If you really think about it, what other mammal in the world has the ability to consciously take their own life? Us? It's weird, isn't it? Anyhow, I personally think it's quite possible that Ben is already interceding for you and the enterprise which he so strongly valued here on Earth. The story I gave a while back about the chance meeting with Bob Bigelow may be proof, proof of this, as you insinuated. As a last comment thrown in there, I'd like to point out that although my many bodies turn up alive or usually dead, some, a good deal, are never found. There's an old adage, if you haven't seen a body, they ain't dead. Well, I'm more than ready to believe that they have in fact died, but whatever took them has not returned that body. For more, would, where would they be? I guess that's a million dollar question. The bodil, bodily resurrection at the Eschaton is another Catholic doctrine, doctrine which sheds this light. Whatever has happened to these bodies now, they will be renewed and glorified in the end of this world, made ready for the world to come. I think the whole missing 411 phenomena is ripe for a good qualified theologian to make a commentary, if they were open enough. There's so many areas to consider, particularly for the traditional understanding of demonology, angelology, and why God has permitted this to even take place. All manner of things will come to light when we are one with God and behold him face to face, we will be enlightened and finally understood God's plan, including how missing 411 and other tragic goings on fit within it. The alternative that is all empty, random and meaningless would be intrinsically unchristian. Everything has meaning, even those things that go on in the dark fringes of our existence where the monsters usually lurk. The devil and his minions may enjoy sadistically trolling us but he doesn't realize that he's already lost and that God works to bring beauty out of the mess he leaves behind. I hope this has been some interest to you, and I do wonder if any other Christian has emailed you with similar ponderings. Yes, I've heard similar things. But, again, that is one of the very rare times where I saw, where I read someone taking a stance that suicide is a sin. So... Whatever. Don't want to get too deep to that. Next story, Dave. I'm a student of history from Serbia. I find your work compelling. This letter contains my aspects on the missing 411, my analysis, and a few questions. I apologize in advance for any potential grammatical errors. Pay attention, people. I've been following your project for over a year now, and if I were to say that your content is thought-provoking, I would probably be making a huge understatement. At first, I didn't have an opinion about the whole ordeal. I just thought it was intriguing. But now, even when I have an opinion of sorts, I'm still aware of how useless it is in relation to this mystery. I have very few conclusions, but one of them is that the people who you claim that... But one of them is that the people who claim that all of this is nonsense either haven't given it some thought or they just refuse to subject their mind to such endeavors and sabotage their inner peace. Certain subjects that are outside of the comfort zone are usually tagged as conspiracy theories and myths, and the people who study these subjects are usually tagged as pseudoscientists. So first of all, anybody who tags this subject as a conspiracy theory, I want all of you to go out there and set the record straight. I have given no theories. This cannot be a conspiracy theory. End of that. We need to start standing up for what's right and use them using the small amount of freedom of speech we do have now. There is a point where certain occurrences cease to be coincidences because they have happened so many times and people still deny it, for it is outside their comfort zone. Are the three missing persons in the Idaho cluster who disappeared on the same day a coincidence? If the tree falls in the forest and there are no witnesses, 
Does it mean that the tree did not fall or that it didn't exist? If we don't have an instrument for explaining it, it doesn't deny its existence. I'm not fond of beliefs. I either know or don't know, but I am willing to form a hypothesis. If there are several clues to which point in a certain direction. I also think that besides critical thinking, it is important to have an open mind, as you said. But after all, facts are more valuable than opinions, and the facts are your weapon, Dave. Some people would say that if something like missing 411 phenomena is true, it would already be widely known and accepted. But I think that is not the case because certain someone doesn't want you to know about it, which is the reason for obscurity. I think we all have an idea of who that someone might be. I wonder why some of the coroners cannot determine the cause of death. Is it because there is actually an absolute lack of evidence, or is it because they have been ordered not to reveal it? I have a third possibility, which refers to the previous letter. What if there's a way to take someone and remove their soul from them, and that causes life to end? What if there was a way? What if our soul was an intrinsic part of our body functioning? Food for thought. Why is it forbidden to record in specific locations in the wilderness or use a drone if there are no known military objects? Good questions. If I remember correctly from your video, video it is also forbidden to read Bigfoot books in certain national parks. Now it's not a illegal to read them, it's illegal to sell them in bookstores in certain national parks. That is true. And I think that is a First Amendment violation, which if I was a millionaire, I'd probably take on, but I'm not and I won't. <laughs> what about the instance where the sheriff was fired or the search was abruptly ceased and authorities are refusing to give information? If there's nothing to hide, why all the secrecy? Let me answer that. A lot of times these small sheriff's departments in the middle of nowhere maybe have uh, deputies that don't have a college degree, don't write very well, they have minimal department resources, and they just don't want to be embarrassed on a national stage on a big search, so they withhold information. I know that's happened before, that's why I bring it up. Along with the occasional FBI and military interest in some of the missing persons cases, one can sense that something big is going on. Something that even the government is probably struggling to understand. Or is it the government in some way responsible for the disappearances? Just speculating. While contemplating about the cases you have researched, I notice that seemingly infinite quantity of these incidents, despite the fact that they do occur very often. That is for the recorded incidents, let alone the unreported or the misinterpreted ones. Who knows how many people would have been forgotten if it wasn't for you, Dave? Because the ones who are supposed to keep record of missing people are not doing a very good job, and definitely not out of ignorance. As a history student, I tend to search for the source, and I can't help but wonder if this phenomenon has things in common with mythology and folklore. Because who knows how far back this thing goes? The topic was already discussed in some of your videos, and I will add my opinion to it. Could the stories and fairy tales from the distant past be an archaic specimens of 411? Surely the animistic society would interpret it as an act of spiritual forces from nature. The ancient Greek would say that it is the work of the several gods, and a medieval Christian would attribute it to the will of the Christ or the devil. In my opinion, every legend has a bit of truth inside, and we use euphor euphemisms to discover it. There are many allegories to folklore that are dedicated to reality, like the incarnations of Horus in Egyptian culture. In my village in rural Serbia, people have been known to mindlessly wander off into the woods, and after being recovered, they had no recollection of the events and couldn't remember why they did it. In Celtic mythology, there is a belief that one could ward off the fae by turning their clothes inside out. And in Finnish folklore, there is the Mitsan Pido, a pocket dimension of sorts where a man can accidentally enter and never find their way out. One can attempt to escape by inverting their clothes. In some of the missing persons cases, people would appear long after the search is over, and if they are alive, they have no recollection of the physical state, often does not match with the environment or time or missing. Would that suggest that they were not actually in this world? A wild guess, but bizarrely fitting one, I would say. 
because there is no rational way of explaining it. Our reason doesn't seem to be the right tool for the job, unfortunately. There are also instances in folklore where the hidden people or the fae live in the world where time passes much slower compared to ours. As you discussed in one of your videos, there have been cases where the Icelandic folk wouldn't allow people to build roads because it would disturb the habitat of the hidden people. In Slavic folklore, there are the Rusaki, female water spirits who would deceive and drown unwary travelers by putting them in a trance-like state. Different cultures that haven't come in contact with each other have been known to have very similar beliefs, such as dragons who appear in Slavic, Nordic, Native American, and many other cultures, which are sometimes separated by oceans. Is it a coincidence? Dragons, I believe, were considered as spiritual creatures, and I can see how that might be related to Bigfoot. Much of the mythology is not supposed to be taken literally, but as allegories, I said earlier. There are also reports of sounds getting louder as the listener walks away from the source of the sound and vice versa. As it was told by one person from your, one of your letters where a guitar melody was being initiated in the forest. There was also such stories in folklore. Our ancestors understood this world and its nature much better than we do now with all the science and because that you are right about listening to Native Americans. Nature is the source of many beautiful things, but just as many dangerous things. And that is what makes it attractive to me. That is why we should listen to our instincts, which are the genetic memory we inherited. There are many parallels I can find, but this and the other people's observations should be enough to give some insight. After all, most of these cases come from the wilderness, the great unknown. Is the wilderness the source and the cradle of this phenomena? And could it be older than man? Is it conscious or sentient? like an intelligent predator, or is its own mindless existence enough to cause trouble like a portal? Still, I would categorize the anomaly by specific entities rather than observing it as a whole. It would contain different entities such as, and there's a list. I want to read one more line to you that I think is important. Why we should listen to our instincts because these are the genetic memories we inherited. Think about that. Did we inherit those from past life reincarnations? Another coincidence. So different entities such as orbs, UFOs, bear-like animals, abducting and sheltering children, water entities, transparent pet predators, portals, Topographical anomalies. These are based on accounts from alleged witnesses and other theories. They would also be some of the symptoms or evidence from the anomalies, such as falling, dre falling trees, undressing, GHB in blood, silence in the forest, bodies found in your civilization, unusual behavior before disappearing. This could be considered as evidence left by the perpetrator. If there is a way we could at least partially understand the anomaly, it would be through trails such as these. If a specific criteria determines whether or not the person will be abducted, didn't it tell us a bit about the anomaly, about the traits and the tendencies? German ancestry, athleticism, elk hunters, intellect, bright colored clothes. It would obviously mean that certain entities seek certain people and there are certain factors that influence the disappearance such as point of separation or factors that hinder the search such as bad weather. If a body is found, does it mean the abductee was unsuitable and they were discarded? The idea of being predetermined is the idea of being predetermined to disappear is unnerving, and there are some indicators which could confirm this. What does that tell us? It could be sentient and conscious, considering the predators and the signals our brain receives, which could be a way of nonverbal communication or simply a genetic instinct. The fact that the bodies appear in places searched prior could tell us that the entity is overseeing the search and knows exactly what searchers are up to. The case where the searcher mentioned that the body couldn't possibly be in a certain location because it was searched before and the body appearing exactly there afterwards could prove this. Regarding cattle mutilation and the perpetrator displaying them to send a message, why are people not mutilated in a similar manner if we are talking about the same cause? There was a case in Brazil where a man was found mutilated in a similar way near a body of water. There's even an autopsy report we can find, and I can remember correctly. 
I also read about a case where a U.S. soldier was found in a desert after reportedly being abducted by a UFO. But these are only based on articles I have read, so I'm not completely sure. Could these be in relationship to cattle mutilations? I don't talk about this much, but I will say this, that UFO abductees in Argentina, Brazil, in that part of South America, they're different. They're different than they are up here in North America. It's almost like they're not the same. The ones in South America are meant to cause fear, anxiety, extreme fear, extreme anxiety. It's almost like it's a mind game down there, much different than it is here. I also wonder if the knowledge about this phenomenon influences the probability of disappearances regarding the individual who is aware or unaware. Does it increase or decrease? In my opinion, one can never be experienced enough in the wilderness to avoid this happening to them. Based on many cases of highly experienced outdoorsmen disappearing, I think there's no way of being competent to the point of completely understanding this phenomenon. But you can take precautions. I would also add that it is better to be considered a paranoid than to succumb to whatever it is out there. So listening to your gut is the right choice. In my country, mushroom hunting is so popular that I had several experiences where I felt uneasy in the woods, but I didn't see anything particular or unusual. While picking mushrooms berries, it is easy to lose sight of your surroundings and companions because you're constantly looking at the ground. So after observing 411, I'm more vigilant in the forest. Good. I have a question. Are there cases of SAR team members disappearing during the search and how often does it happen? Yes, there are cases and it is very, very, very uncommon. But the time it has happened, they were never found. If my memory serves me well, there was a case where two planes disappeared while searching for another plane, and another where a searcher disappeared on foot before appearing dead later. Keep hunting for the truth, Dave, despite all the difficult circumstances. My condolences for your loss. As someone who's dealing with a progressively worsening mental illness for 13 years now, I can certainly understand how you can feel betrayed by their own psyche and how suicide seems like the only situation. Thank you for taking the time to read my lengthy letter. My pleasure. Letters like that, and a couple others I read today, they have me walking around on a hike thinking about how confusing our environment really is. It is very confusing. And if you think about the possibilities of what really exists. And what else exists that we have no idea may be out there. If that was really in the forefront of your mind, your life may change. Oftentimes, I think of a surveyor in the woods they're working alone. Even if there's two of them, sometimes they're very far apart. And they're usually in areas that can be quite remote. And if you're the first one to step on a piece of ground, do you really know what you're stepping on? I've told, told this audience before, I'll tell you again, to watch a segment on the X-Files called Detour, D-E-T-O-U-R. And I was told about this 10, 12 years ago. And they said, Dave, this is going to sound a lot like your research. And uh, it's an interesting episode, to say the least. All right, let's get to the stories about the missing people today. The first story has to do with an Alaskan case. And... Uh, pretty weird. There's a lot of different cases in Alaska. What does Alaska have that most states don't? You step a mile outside of most cities in Alaska and it's really rural quick. Big predators, lots of wildlife, and you could get easily lost. Well, Earl Ashworth was 56 years old and went missing August 10th, 2018 at about 5 p.m. His nickname was Rocky, and he lived in Palmer, Alaska, in a little house. 
love the outdoors, love living in Alaska. And on August 10th, he went with a group of friends to go and seek out an old gold mine. And let me show you where this place was, first of all. Here's Anchorage. He lived in Palmer, which is just north, right about here. They came down the highway, Highway 1. And at about this point, there is a very, very steep embankment coming off the road. And this is where the mine was located. Well, all of his friends arrived. Take a look at that. There's a creek at the bottom. There's water everywhere around this location. And his buddies decided to go down the hill. And Rocky decided to stay up at the car with his dog named Cruiser. And Cruiser was a 10-year-old dog in really good shape. But they stayed together always. Well, his buddies came back up the hill at about 5 p.m. and Rocky was gone. So they started to search and they looked everywhere they could. I'll give you this. That's Rocky. Well, then they called the Alaska State Troopers and there was a huge search. They brought in canines, they brought in helicopters, ground pounders, uh, all kinds of things. Canines never could pick up a scent. That was troubling. They didn't find any tracks leaving the area. There was some rain at the time of the search. Rocky was wearing a cutoff t-shirt uh, and some blue jeans. On the t-shirt was uh, an eagle. He would never walk away from his dog. His mom actually went out to the site. His mom was uh, 76 years old. Went out, saw the site, said it doesn't make any sense. Rocky would never leave his dog. He'd never walk away from the cars. It's not an area where there's any crime per se. So to think that there's some road crime is ridiculous. There was no signs of animal predation. Uh, no scent trail, no tracks. Water's in the area. It's been three years plus years, and there's never been any evidence of Rocky Earl Ashworth, 56 years old. Now, I find mines interesting because with mines comes a lot of history. But he didn't go to the mine. He stayed up on the road, and his partners went down a really steep incline to get down into the location. When you think about the possibilities yeah, they're in a pretty rural place, but they're on a major highway. The thought of him getting in a car without his dog, zero. The thought about somebody forcing him into the car, I don't see that happening. He didn't have that type of background, passive man. So, what happened to Rocky? I don't know. Alaska State Troopers would like to know, that's for sure. So, talk about the next case. Ivan Schaefer, 65 years old, disappeared September 20th, 1995 at 2 p.m. The location of this incident was just below Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming and just northeast of Teton National Park in Wyoming. It's an area where hunters go hunt elk. It's a good area to go because the elk like to congregate and they know they're safe in the national parks and when they come out to breed and eat, etc., they become vulnerable. Well, they were elk hunting and Ivan was with two friends, Jim Keen and Alan Brown, lifetime friends. And they were, uh, Ivan was from Riverton, Wyoming. He had a bad hip and was described as a heavy chain smoker. He'd walk maybe maximum 600 yards and he'd have to sit down and take a long break. Well, the hunters were established camp in a specific area and then they went out and they were about a mile from camp and they decided to split up and hunt different locations. And they agreed to meet back at camp later on. Well, Ivan had a 30-06 rifle. He was just warm. 
And again, he was last seen at about 2 p.m. Agreed to meet back at camp that night. He didn't come back. Hunters went out, looked for him, waited for him until the afternoon the next day, and then got on horseback, rode back, and got a hold of the sheriff. And the Teton County Sheriff knew from all the reports from people they spoke to that Ivan was a lifetime outdoorsman, hunted since he was very young, very aware of his surroundings, smart man, but didn't have a lot of stamina and was partially disabled because of his hip. So there was an eight day search. And during that eight days, they brought in helicopters, 50 searchers, uh, three different dog teams over the course of those days, equestrians, ground pounders, and the sheriff was frustrated. He said, we didn't find a damn thing. And he didn't think it was right. Based on the criteria that they were given about Ivan, they couldn't believe it, that they weren't finding him. They didn't find anything. And so what they did is they turned to his friends and they started to think that something criminal happened and they started to actively look at his friends as maybe murdering him. When you look at everything in its totality, I don't see it, but maybe he had things that I didn't understand and wasn't in the reports. Well, on August 14th, 1998, a very weird thing happened. About four miles from where Ivan was last seen, another hunter was on horseback. And the circumstances behind this happening are just bizarre. He's slowly walking his horse through a, a meadow setting, four miles south of where Ivan was seen. Ivan's camp, Ivan's camp was a mile east, so how he got four miles south, anybody's clue. But as the horse is walking along, he steps on something and it flings up into the air, grabs the hunter's attention, and he sees it fall on the ground and he thinks he sees a bone. He dismounts, picks up the bone, and it looks like a piece of a skull. He takes it back to the Teton County Sheriff and they go for DNA testing. Well, there's only one hunter missing anywhere within 20 miles and that was Ivan. So the Teton Sheriff goes for DNA testing on the bone and then brings in another 20 people to search the area where this hunter found this, this bone. And in the reports it said that the sheriff had one of the canines tracked to a big log jam next to this creek. And the dog was going crazy at this log jam, like there's a body buried or something because it's cadaver canine. So they did, the report said, they dug a massive hole. There was nothing there. So what's the dog hitting on? What happened? The DNA analysis came back positive for Ivan. Now, here's the weird, 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 weird part about this story, okay? So, again, you're south of Yellowstone National Park and northeast from Teton National Park. Here's Pinion Peak, here's Gravel Peak, here's the hunter's camp. He was last seen here about a mile from camp in a high area, lots of water, lots of small lakes all through here. Remember what I told you about small lakes in high altitude. Well, He's found four miles south of here across some big mountains in an area called Pacific Creek. Pacific Creek is only a mile, very short distance to one of the major roads crossing this area. And that was the only bone they found of him. So, what are the important points here? I've told you before that a lot of the victims in what I write about have some type of disability. Well, I haven't had one. He had a bad hip. He also had a point of separation. He was with the other hunters and they decided to go different directions. He was around all kinds of water. There was water probably within 100 yards of where he was last seen. 
He was in a subgroup of missing people, hunters. Canines were brought in. They couldn't pick up a scent. And lastly, well, actually not lastly, and there was a lot of granite in this area because of the mountains and the exposure. And the last significant point, he was German. Now, as I've stated before, more German people go missing than any other that I can figure out. So, Ivan Schaefer, 65 years old, September 20th, 95. One of the last articles I reviewed for this, the sheriff was still extremely frustrated because they could never find any, anything, his rifle, his clothes, his belt, his boots. Belt and boots will last almost forever, especially belt buckle, rifle. Where is it? How did he get four miles away without being picked up by search and rescue? Makes no sense. Next case, I want to ask you a question. I think I knew when I was a young policeman that I, I wanted to have a mastery level ability at interviewing people and just generally investigating crimes. So to get to that mastery of any skill or profession, how would you describe that? So not every detective has a mastery level of skill. Trust me, I've seen too many that probably shouldn't have been garbage men, but and that's not demeaning garbage men. <laughs> I'm just saying that these people shouldn't have been police detectives. But mastery skill level, and that's what this person in this next story had. I'm confident of this. But a mastery of a skill, complete understanding of the topic, and a complete ability to execute at all levels. Mastery level. When I read this story, I couldn't believe the more I read about it, the more I got upset. And then it just blew my mind. Mike Bratley, 67 years old, missing June 8, 2012, north of Duluth, Minnesota. He lived in a little city called Lakeville with his wife. And Mike, like I said, had this unbelievable ability. And I'm going to say it because I think it's true. He had an unbelievable ability at flying. So when he was young, he joined the Navy. And he flew F-4 Phantoms off a carrier deck. Now, for people who are just going to slough that off, landing on a carrier deck is 100% different than landing on solid ground. A carrier deck could be going up and down 10, 15 feet side to side, and you're going to put that jet on a piece of metal that is probably one-tenth the size or less of a regular runway. It's a phenomenal skill that takes guts, intellect, and an unbelievable amount of patience to get to that level. But he did. F4 Phantom. Now, that was his first professional flying job that I could find. The next, he's hired on November 15th, 1985. He's hired by Northwest Airlines to fly DC-9s. And he flew for Northwest until 2006, 21 years. Now, there were several pilots that described Mike as absolutely meticulous and extremely safety conscious, went through protocols no matter what, and would be the last person in the world 
for them to believe that he went missing or crashed. So, he retires in 2006. And he purchases a Piper Navajo. It's white and blue with red stripes. Very, very similar in structure to this. This is a Piper Navajo. But he bought one. Loved to fly. Loved to take friends out. He just had a new engine put in the plane. And he went on a flight from Fleming Field in South Minneapolis to Duluth and back. There was no flight plan. And that was normal. That still is normal today. Now this is Mike. He wasn't just your normal pilot either. He had many, many other skills to enhance his brilliance. He played an instrument. He composed music. He had some of his music played at some of the biggest things around Minneapolis. He was a brilliant guy, multidimensional, super safety conscious. I, I mean, the more I read about him, it's just like this wasn't supposed to happen. Well, what did happen? So, let me get you up close on this. This is Fleming Field in South Minneapolis. He's going to take his plane out for a test flight. He's going to fly up here to Duluth, swing around, and come back and land. I'm going to let you look at this while I tell you what happened. So this is Lake Superior up here. Last radio contact was north of Duluth. He had a cell phone ping northeast of Silver Bay. Well, Silver Bay is right here. North, east, right near the coast in Silver Bay is where he was last seen. Up here is the Canadian border. This, Hiawatha National Forest and Newberry. I'm going to talk about this area and how this relates to this in a second. But his phone, he had it on, his cell phone, it was on. And not that he made a call, but it just pinged off some towers up there. Right? He was also carrying a personal locator beacon. Now, these are activated if you crash. The sudden jolt activates it, and it goes on. Well, the cell phone last pinged north of Silver Bay. He didn't report back to Fleming Field, and he kept his plane at the Lisdale Flying Service. When he didn't return that day, they called the Coast Guard, the Civil Air Patrol, the Border Patrol and the Minnesota Natural Resources and the U.S. Air Force all immediately went to the air and started looking for Mike. They were listening for a personal locator beacon. During a week-long search, there were high winds that stopped the search. Nobody could develop an idea about why he would be in the area north of Silver Bay. Why would he be in that area? The million dollar question. Now, let me take you back a couple months. I did a video about an Air Force jet that was scrambled from a field here. And it was asked to intercept an unidentified flying object in this area, right on the border between Canada and the US. This two-man fighter intercepted it. They became one, and it disappeared. Never found. Now, later, Canada said, oh, it wasn't really a UFO. We determined it was something else. Well, what happened to our jet and the two pilots on it? And I talked about this in the video, and I will attach that video to this if you haven't seen it. It'll be under the comments section and uh, description of, the video, of this video. In Lake Superior, just like all the Great Lakes, there's been a lot of very, very weird coincidences. And odd sightings. 
If you Google Silver Bay, Minnesota UFO sightings, see what you come up with. I'm not going to tell you. But, so, when Mike was in his early 20s, his dad was working in Alaska as a uh, pilot, flying a float plane. I couldn't believe it when I found this. In June 26, 1968, in the Fairbanks Daily News, this is the article. And who was flying the plane that crashed and got killed? Mike's dad. It says two employees of the Department of Fish and Game were killed Monday when their float plane crashed and burned in an experimental moose pen on, Kenai, on the Kenai Peninsula. Killed were Arthur E. Bratley, 51 of Anchorage, the biologist in charge of the moose research in Anchorage area, John J. Frank, 33, a doctor of veterinary science. Sterling I, a department biologist, said the two men were flying from Anchorage to work on animals in the mile square moose pens when the accident occurred. They were traveling in a float plane, Piper Super Cub, with Bratley at the controls. I can't believe it. So Mike would have been 22, 23 back then. Probably was in the service. But the point being, two men in the same family. I guess we can say they both died. I don't know. And plane crashes. What makes Mike's different? So I have a lot of friends. I had a lot of friends that were pilots and then commercial pilots. And every every so often in a career, they have to go in and have simulator training. Simulator training is everything. One engine goes out, two engines go out. Um, glide slope, how long the plane will glide. Can you land it with one engine? Can you land it with no engines? How do you respond to this emergency? Are you cool? And you're with a chief pilot or you're with an instructor that teaches you what you did right, what you did wrong, and you go through it again. Most private pilots never get this. So, when an engine goes out on a private plane, you've never practiced what you're going to do. But Mike had practiced probably hundreds of times. And that Piper Navajo he was flying with twin engines, the chances of both engines going out simultaneously, almost never. And that, that could fly easily on one engine with one person in the, in the pilot seat. And at about a thousand mile distance with fuel tanks. The other part that was confusing is that many people said that that's a fairly good sized plane. And if it crashed, there would be an oil slick, gas slick, things floating in the water. They didn't find anything. And it's been, boy, nine years. They still never found anything. When you think about Mike's ability behind the wheel of a plane, compared to a normal person's ability behind the wheel of a car, he was so far more experienced, better trained, had the demeanor than almost anyone I've ever seen. Guaranteed anybody I've ever seen who's disappeared. He had over 40 years of the best training in the world. Where could he go? This one is a really confusing one to me, except that it's in that area of the Great Lakes that has a long history of planes disappearing. 
and odd disappearances. I cannot... His friend said that, honestly, his friend said that Mike would be the last person they would ever think would disappear in an airplane. These were other pilots. Well, Mike Bratley, 67 years old, disappeared on June 8, 2012. Ivan Schaefer, 65 years old, disappeared on September 20th at 2 p.m. And Earl Rocky Ashworth, 56 years old, disappeared in Alaska, August 10th, 2018. You could do me a lot of favors by trying to post these on your social media site. Give me a thumbs up if you like the video. You can follow me on Twitter at Dave Politis at Can I'm Missing. Our documentaries are still on, on the web on YouTube movies. You can watch. You can go also go to Amazon.com and watch them. Don't buy, please don't buy my books on Amazon, eBay, any place online other than our website or you're going to get ripped off. So please don't do that. And our website is listed under description of the video or the pin number one comment. You know, sometimes when I get done with these videos, I get depressed, just a bit. Because I think about these people's lives. I think about Mike Bradley and his wife and his kids. and What are they thinking when their dad... I mean, if that was my dad and he said, hey, I'm going to go for a flight, I wouldn't give it two seconds of thought about him being safe. If there was one guy that's going to live, it's going to be him. Like we stated earlier in the letters, our world is much more complex than we think. I appreciate you being here. And if YouTube is willing, I'll be back again. Have a great week. Politis out.